Welcome to We Hear Her. I am Erin Trenbeth Murray. And I am Jennifer Bean. We're here today with another amazing woman who's sharing her story and insights to lessons learned. Hi there, I'm Erin Trenbeth Murray and welcome to the We Hear Her podcast through Women Who Succeed. I am excited today to talk to my good friend and boss, Rick Fulkerson, who is the president for the Success in Education Foundation. And I want to jump into a little bit about his background. It's really unique. There's a lot of sales background in it. And um, working with the Ken Garf Auto Group, which has then led him to a really successful strategy and platform for supporting students across the state of Utah. So I'm just going to dive in a little bit to, to talk about um, his background. He got his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Utah and his auto management, management degree from General Motors Dealer Academy. As I mentioned, he's president of the foundation and within the foundation there are five programs, Keys to Success, Road to Success, Women Who Succeed, eSports, Ken Garth eSports, and our Code to Success program. So he has a lot going on on his plate. In addition to that, um, those programs provide a variety of opportunities and pathways for students to get to college and careers that have really come from Rick's vision of changing lives across the state and beyond. He is also the vice president for the Ken Garf Auto Group. The Ken Garf Automotive Group is the eighth largest automotive group in the nation, and they own and operate dealerships in Utah, Iowa, Michigan, Texas, Colorado, Arizona, Wyoming, and Nevada, and California. Rick oversees the community initiatives that are sponsored by the Ken Garf Automotive Group, and he works closely promoting the Army and helping high school students see the value of the Army Reserve and building their education. This is my favorite part. Rick built an egg farm in Bam. It's Bamakomali, excuse me. Bamakomali. Yeah, Bamakomali. So it's uh, it's in the north northwest portion of Africa. It's towards the Ivory Coast. I have not been there. I'll have so, to go visit. I'll have to go visit the egg farm. One of the top five poorest countries in the world. Wow. It hosts twenty one thousand hens that lay eggs, and the proceeds from the eggs are used to build schools in Mali and help provide needed jobs to the people, people of Mali. Rick also lived in Colombia for 14 months, providing service to the people of Colombia. You have a wife and two sons, and how many grandchildren? Three, three. grandchildren. Millie's five, three. Davis is three, and Jones is one. Love it. Well, I'm so happy to have you here today. And some folks may wonder, why is Rick Fulkerson <laughs> on the Women Who Succeed podcast. And our number one reason is because you're our biggest champion and our biggest male ally. And I wanted to talk with you about that today and get your perspectives on a few things. I specifically, when you and I first started talking about the possibility of this and how do we build confidence and leadership skills in girls and young women across the state of Utah, you were either as excited or more excited than I was and could see a real vision for that. And I remember you sharing with me the importance of that, of the initiative as it ties back to your granddaughter. And I'd love if you could spend a few minutes talking to us a little bit about Millie and, and, your, and your vision for her for the future. Well, you know, raising two boys, um, you, you take for granted just of all the opportunities that really are presented to uh, young men growing up that really are somewhat stymied for young women. And it wasn't really until Millie kind of came into my life that I'm like, wait a minute, I want just as many opportunities for Millie as my own two boys. And so, you know, as, as you approached the idea and talked to me about, hey, what do you think about this? I'm like, oh, absolutely. How do we, how do we collaborate and how do we find uh, mechanisms to help young women see the value and the importance of, of networking, the importance of uh, collaborating, the importance of equal pay and equal job opportunities and equal educational opportunities, and that it's not a man's world, it's, uh, it's a partnership, that all men and women have equal opportunities. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, we need to, to promote and collaborate in that regard. 
and growing up in the automotive business, well, that's where I cut my teeth, it has a strong propensity for men in the business. And part of it is just the, the hours, you know, and it, mm -hmm. I think women have a, have a real challenge um, because of childbearing issues. It just, mm -hmm. it, it does take them out of the workforce because of the stress and strain of bearing children. But that doesn't mean that uh, businesses should not be more sensitive and more collaborative and more um, helpful ar around that time frame. And we just, and the world's changing, you know? I mean, it, uh, the 40s and 50s and 60s, there was a different element. Today, it needs to just continue to promote and push equality mm -hmm. uh, and really one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one of all the opportunities that are available. You know, when you, you've given me such incredible opportunities in so many regards, and one of the things that I've really valued about being part of your team is I have felt that you valued my perspective and I being in a fairly male dominant um, the automotive world right and then many of our donors to date were were male and I thought isn't it great how he sees the value and the beauty in having a different thought process a different background a different perspective and I just think that that's really I hate to say unique but I think it's very eye-opening um, how much you've embraced that, and I appreciate that. Well, I, you know, I've had some strong, uh, I think I've had some strong women role models. Um, what I find interesting is women in the car business um, are very strong, and they're strong-willed. They have a, they have a passion for the business, and, and I've rubbed shoulders with some great women in the car business. I mean, Louise McDonald um, was a controller in our organization. It was just, I loved her perspective, and I learned from her. You know, uh, I have the benefit of ha uh, having a very close relationship with Catherine Garf, not only from her perspective as a chair of our foundation, but she's my mother-in-law. And she is a very, very strong and amazing woman. And her, her, her perspective is just phenomenal. My wife is very quiet, but she has very strong attributes in her own personal way. And those, those attributes are really valuable to me and I see the strengths in you, and I see the strengths in the other women in our foundation. And um, why would I, why would I not want to listen? <laughs> why would I not want to um, hear your perspective, especially with your own expertise in not, in the world of nonprofit? Mm -hmm. um, I value what you have to say, and I value what our team members have to say, even if they're young and inexperienced. They have perspective. And youth sometimes really understands perspective around student cause, student issues far more than um, maybe somebody as mature as I. <laughs> well, to that point, I want to ask you what, how you would define being a male ally. Well, I think, um, I think probably the most important thing we can do is listen. Um, I think we, we need to understand perspective. And I also believe that we also just need to, um, we have to think differently. We have to think of how we treat our hiring practices and how we, um, we treat our, um, our promotions within, within different companies. And that's a broad-based statement. And I just, um, it's not that we necessarily need to favor one gender over another. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that are we doing everything we can to one, train and build from within, um, hire and make sure that we're providing um, the same opportunities and maybe the same number of qualified candidates? If we have four male qualified candidates and one female qualified candidate, why don't we have three more? Why don't we have four and four? And that's part of the effort that needs to take place so that if we have eight qualified candidates and we want to choose the most qualified candidate, then all of a sudden gender becomes, doesn't become the issue, it's the most qualified candidate that becomes the issue. And to me, that's, that's what matters most. And being in, a, in the world of nonprofit, I think, there's, I think there's a lot more women that are engaged in nonprofit mm -hmm. causes, you know? Mm -hmm. So I get the benefit of working with more and more women, women on a, on a daily basis around 
the issues of education, the importance of education. And so th I think that needs to expound out to other uh, types of businesses. And I know the Ken Garf Automotive Group is working hard to identify how they go through the hiring process and the interview process and the promotion process around making more opportunities available to the women in our organization. Because we have powerful and amazing, talented women in the automotive group. And we need more. Mm -hmm. We need more of those types of women that want it as a career, want to develop their opportunities within the automotive footprint. We love it. And the automotive, I think the industry is 27% industry for female. Um, so it's it's got a ways to go yeah. for sure. I think your efforts with, with higher education this year, both with degree seeking and with um, two-year degrees, and there's several, UVU, Salt Lake Community College, there's several opportunities in that realm of mechanics and the automotive world. What advice or thoughts would you have about how to engage and promote young women to look at careers maybe in the automotive industry? I mean, the Ken Garf Automotive can be as inclusive and as open as they you know possibly can, but if the workforce coming to them is all male, then that's going to be that's sure. going to be difficult to do. Yeah, it's self fulfilling. Yeah, and I I think one of the areas that I think we can do a better job is um, is helping our educators understand that mm -hmm. young women can be just as amazing mechanics or coders or programmers or you know whether what, what other male industries doctors mm -hmm. you know I I think young women need to be told that they can be be just as successful. And I think the cheering and the encouraging and the, 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 the verbalization of saying you can do this if that's what you want to do or that's what you want to be, I just think we, we need less stereotyping and more um, cheerleading around all industries. And less, uh, just, just less, you know, hey, women fit a certain role. No, they don't. Mm -hmm. It's, it's individuals in our world that pigeonhole individuals and we we need to stop that because i just think there's a lot of young women that in sixth seventh and eighth grade that are less encouraged about math and science and more encouraged about um, social work or communications or art projects and to me that's stereotyping that's driving um, women and pigeonholing them into career choices that are just stereotypical. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop that. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to help young women understand that they have just as much potential and opportunity in engineering, in math, in science, in STEM related fields, where there's just a strong and heavy emphasis on the, on the male side of the equation. That needs to stop. And if we just did that, I honestly believe that we would see more than 20%, 27% in the automotive industry as a whole. Mm -hmm. That would change. It would, we would find more women saying, man, I didn't know that being a mechanic was such a, a cool opportunity. Not only that, but it's high wages. It's great wages. It's, you know, I love working with my hands. I love working with tools. I'm working with computers. Computers, yeah. Yeah. So I think those things have real relevance. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it really starts it really starts with families and educators. And I think parents need to say, is it, is it okay for my daughter to be a mechanic? I, I mean, is, is a parent willing to say that? Yeah. And I would say, you, you should, because I know what, I mean, we have six-figure mechanics that are making very good money that work in a great environment. Well, speak to that a little bit more, because maybe share with the group, the audience, a little bit about the Keys to Success app. Because everything that you're describing philosophically is tangible and puts forth opportunities that may, students may have never thought of. I wonder if you could speak a little to that. Sure. I mean, the app really allows students, uh, one, the app talks to students the way they want to be talked to. So the communication level is in is small bursts of information. And they that's how they absorb, one. Two, it really allows them to identify career choice, career development either through a process of going through and testing and attribute and personality profiling, or, hey, I like these five career choices, 
Now what what's open to me? And the app pushes all of that information saying, well, here are the scholarships that are available. Have you thought about these kinds of internships? We have these kinds of webinars and open houses. This is what the university is offering in the form of curriculum. This is, um, here are the CTE courses that are available all while you're in high school. Oh, and by the way, if you go to any of the technical colleges while you're in high school, it's free. Those are scholarships that are available to you right now. So all that information is packaged up in one tool and resource. And so they don't have to go run around and search for all sorts of different resources. It's right at their fingertips. Because we all know students walk around with one eye on their cell phone <laughs> and one eye on the world. Yeah. And that's how, they, that's how they source their information. And so that tool and the resource would make a huge difference in the lives of so many students. Not only junior high and high school students, but the app is also available for adults. Mm -hmm. Well, like you always say, changing lives, transferring li transforming lives one student at a time. Right. And that's, that's what you live, that's what you breathe, that's what what all of your programming really does. I think what I'd love to know in um, two, I have a couple follow-up questions that, one is I'm curious, like let's say that you were assigned a, a mentee um, that was a young man, um, and what advice or guidance would you give to him um, if you were giving him a tutorial, for example, on um, the equality, the importance, the desire for perspective of growing and developing female staff? Wow, that's a great question. What I would say is that I would um, I'd really um, focus in on that um, if you're going to mentor, you're going to train. And are you, are you willing to train young women and young, women, young men the same way? Mm -hmm. And so training mechanisms are really important. And are you inclusive in all your training? So, you know, and what are you doing to broaden that footprint? And if you, um, you might have young women in your organization or women in your organization that you're overseeing that are not, um, are not being um, invited. Change that. Start with an invitation. Start with an invitation for them to participate. You might have a, in the automotive uh, industry, you might have a sales receptionist Mm -hmm. But why wouldn't you invite her to participate in sales training? Open her eyes to the opportunities. She might have never thought about being a sales person, sales associate in the automotive industry. But if she gets to sit in on training and participates and engages, she might be your very best next sales associate. And so it's the engagement. It's the invitation. It's feeling wanted mm -hmm. and feeling like I can do this. To me, those are... Those are really powerful answers to women's initiatives. If they feel wanted, if they feel like they can, they will do. And I really believe that. Mm. And, um, but they need to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of uh, support. And I think there are some young men that just charge ahead, listen or not listen, that they just go ahead and do. I think more women want to feel like they're a part of something bigger. And that, that's a, those are general statements. That's not always true. I would agree. I would but, agree. But I, that's my, mm -hmm. my feeling and sense. And, um, and so, and, you know, working in nonprofit for 18 years and, um, you know, our group has a tendency to have more women in our organization. And so I think I've learned over time that a lot of encouragement and a, a belief that they can do or they can take the next step that it sometimes just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy by promoting it and by driving it. And it works. I love how you said the invitation. That was really struck me when you said, you know, extend the invitation. Every, everyone wants to feel um, wanted, feel value, feel that they're contributing. And that invitation opening that door up that then they might have some thoughts or can contribute in a way they never thought possible. That could be the next step. Sure. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I love that. You know, I've had I've had some pretty strong, really good mentors that were men, and adore them and learned so much from them. I'm and there aren't as many females in leadership roles in Utah as there are men. I'm just curious if you've had a female um, mentor in some regard. 
Well, I, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, I, you know, growing up a little bit of a different era, uh, I think um, there have been, um, there have been powerful women that have been very quiet but have made a huge difference in my life. I will tell you that one of the greatest influencers in my life has been my mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. She just, um, she's extremely passionate about education. She's extremely passionate about um, fairness and equality mm -hmm. and, um, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And to me, those, you know, being a newlywed with Jennifer and listening to Kathy share those thoughts and sentiments around the dinner table has really shaped me. And the, the importance of inclusion, the importance of treating everybody equally. And, it, you know, it's interesting. I was walking out the door of my office today, and there's a, a wonderful, amazing custodial gal lady by the name of, of Carmen. I see her all the time. And without fail, I will not go out of that building if I see her with not recognizing her and saying thank you for what she does. Mm -hmm. And are we willing to compliment everybody in our lives? Are we willing to say hello? Are we willing to recognize people for all the great things they do, even if they're doing custodial work, all the way to the CEO of our company? Because there's a lot of people that will go out of their way to say hello to a CEO. There are a lot of people that won't go out of their way to say hello to somebody that's doing the custodial work in their building. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to make sure that we fight tooth and nail to treat everybody with respect and dignity and an invitation to come be a part of us. So well said. I am so grateful that you could spend some time with us today and get your perspective as a male ally and champion for, for women. And just listening to you speak, what, you're, what you say reflects what you do on a daily basis that I get to see. And I'm really happy that um, you've shared some, some careful thoughts with us. And I hope that the young women and the young men out there in the high schools and junior highs that are listening to you think through some of the life lessons that you've given today and the advice and guidance, because it's truly wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. We're sure grateful to have you on our team. Oh, that's my, that's my best part. I love it. I love being a part. So with that, we would like to say thanks so much for joining us today with Rick Fulkerson, and we look forward to having you again at our We Hear Her podcast. Thank you for taking time to hear her. Join our efforts and learn more at womenwhosucceed.org. A big thank you to our sponsor, the Clark and Christine Ivory Foundation.